question. Certainly, we ask that you submit all questions via the chat function, uh, and we are certainly monitoring the chat that is uh, available within Zoom. Um, and then for this uh, session, we are using Poll Everywhere. Uh, to contribute towards answering the polls, uh, please, uh, you can just text uh, CLO Healthcare uh, to uh, 22333. Once you do that, you'll get a feedback back that says you've been enrolled in the poll. You can also go online and download the Poll Everywhere app uh, and then use the username CLO Healthcare to join. And, it, and if you do that, you'll actually see in real time uh, the answers that come through as, they, as individuals respond to it. So super exciting to use that. And Dr. Park and I will be certainly uh, leveraging that in some of our conversations today. Um, so with that in mind, uh, quick introductions. Um, I'll do mine. I, as Olivia mentioned, I serve as the Chief Learning Officer at CA Healthcare. I've been involved in healthcare simulation and medicine for uh, over 20 years. I've, my background is primarily on the pre-hospital emergency services. I've done disaster medicine and critical care transport, advocate in the research side of the house, and certainly well involved in the Society for Simulation Healthcare in a, a number of different roles, as well as it, from a writing perspective. I'll uh, pass the baton off to Dr. Park if you'd like to introduce yourself. Let's see if. Uh... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Christine Park. I am the director of Simulation and Integrative Learning Institute at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, and uh, I have um, had oh my gosh, twenty five years of experience in medicine, um, starting in general surgery and then switching over to anesthesiology. Uh, and some of you might know me from my role in SSH. Um, I was a pres I was the uh, president in 2017. Thank you so much. So we're going to drive this uh, a very conversational in nature. And so um, the PowerPoint elements that you'll see pop up are primarily questions to guide some of the discussions. But our hope is to contribute to the larger conversation around healthcare simulation and safety. Um, the uh, World Patient Safety Day is September 17th. Um, and so uh, sponsored by the World Health Organization, I think it's important for us to remember a lot of our work is around quality and patient safety. And so you'll see us just converse and talk about different things. So I think, Dr. Park, we're going to start off with patient safety as the first topic of discussion, right? Um, so we're going to throw this poll question out there, right? So according to uh, a report from the Institute of Medicine, mistakes in hospitals kill about half as many Americans each year as car accidents. And we'll open the poll up. You'll be able to actually uh, to answer the questions that are um, posted here. Um, Maybe, there it is. Uh, so you'll be able to answer this and uh, we'll see the answers come in real time. Um, uh, and so as we're seeing these answers come in, uh, what do you think, Dr. Park? Do you think that uh, this uh, is 50-50 uh, or, or do you think car accidents and trauma are still the leading cause of death? Well, I don't wanna lead the ans uh, answers, but I would say um, I wish that this was true, and it's probably not true. Oh, poll issues. Um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, the, the answer is it, it is false indeed, right? So the answer is that it is not true, the answer is false. And part of the interesting thing with this is that hospital mistakes uh, in one study really show that 98% um, of errors are done in healthcare, whereas the comparison shows that roughly 44,000 deaths are, are by vehicles. But how is that the case? I mean, you're in medicine, you're in anesthesiology, you're actually practicing today. I mean, where do you think the challenges exist in healthcare safety and patient safety? Well, it's a, it's a great question and where to begin. Um, I think thinking about mistakes, we have to include not only the direct mistakes, but the latent errors, which are all of the preconditions that allow errors to happen. Um, most people are familiar with the Swiss cheese model. Yeah. And with the layers of, of protection and care and prevention and training that we have, you would think that we wouldn't have as many errors as we do. Well, and uh, I mean, so let's let's mix this with quality and patient safety as an example. And so, so much of our work in healthcare and simulation is driven by the notion of of leveraging risk management teams and other teams to help drive education across the board. In your current role, working um, 
in, in the director of simulation, like how have you been successful in bringing the two elements together? I'm sure many folks on the phone are having challenges or may have had challenges bringing risk and patient safety at the same table of leveraging simulation to tie it together. So really putting the feedback together. I mean, how have you been able to really match that hurdle and, 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 and uh, move across the line? You know, actually for this, I really would be interested in learning from the success stories of people who are on this call. Yeah. It's my experience that some of the, at least one of the major reasons why the simulation enterprise with the um, hospital risk management and quality enterprise often don't readily intermingle is because often simulation is reporting up through education, through a educational institutional structure. So a college of medicine, a college of nursing, a college of pharmacy. And in the hospital, that's a different the risk and quality is a different reporting structure. So those two groups don't naturally hang out together. And so the relationship has to be proactively created. And that's really been a challenge for me. Yeah, and I mean, coming out of that uh, that background uh, a little bit for me, one of the challenges I always had is, you know, it was a struggle, certainly, and um, the quality and patient safety teams oftentimes didn't want to share that data, right? It was certainly a, a challenge to get some of that data, especially in some of the larger systems. But when we were able to sit at the at the table and be part of safety event reviews and see the SSA scores coming in, um, it really did make an impact, right? You were able to say simulation can do X, Y, and Z for your organization, and here is how we can help you. And I think in the interim, some of the some of the win wins are oftentimes driven by showing what you can accomplish, right? So doing an insight to developing an after action report and sharing that information with others certainly drives that, uh, that messaging forward. And, you know, where do you go from here, right? I mean, how do, we, how do we move the curve forward? Hospital errors are still happening. Patient safety is still a concern. Medication errors are happening. Um, you're charting and documenting in your EHR and yet we still have problems with kilograms to pounds in the conversion cycle. So how do you think, you know, what are, what are some options that we can use or what options do you think we have out there that will help mitigate some of these mistakes in the future for folks that, folks that are listening could help try to drive in their organizations? Are, are you asking rhetorically or are you it's asking It's a bit of a rhetorical for... question. No, it's, a, it's a bit of a rhetorical I, question too, right? But yeah, no, interesting. I mean, wow, it's what the, is that's a million dollar question. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are many kind of force functions that are potentially in place, like barcode readers or, you know, um, instituting, um, you know, double checks before administering medication and so forth. Um, personally, I think all of that stuff is great. And I think in order for this to succeed, it's a, we're talking about a culture change of teamwork, really, fundamentally, um, because, um, most of the times when errors happen, somebody in the room noticed that there was an issue um, and either didn't feel empowered to um, speak up or it was not the culture to speak up. Um, and so that hardwired mechanism of communication around speaking up needs to be a part of every institution. I know different institutions have different levels of success with that. Yeah. But well, I'm also even thinking like a, a simulation error, and I can think back to from 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 past life uh, where you know a medication error in the lab oftentimes revealed a hidden trend, right? It became a window into a larger organizational problem across the board. Um, I mean, have you ever have you ever seen where that that small error in the lab that you see amongst multiple students that are performing ends up being something much larger that you've just kind of brushed upon or, or just found out by happenstance that nobody else knew that was there, right? And I can think of, you know, a drug that's, that was supposed to be in a, uh, um, a bolus, uh, sorry, a drip administration that ends up being an IV push, right? And you see that trend repeatedly from student to student to student. And you wonder if it's a preceptor or something else. I mean, have you ever had that, insti insti uh, that situation where you've seen that happen in your lab? Yeah, actually, uh, so I uh, have seen a, in a simulation of practicing anesthesiologists. Um, we created a scenario that was actually based on a real error uh, of a medication error and we created a scenario around that and um, what we realized is 
because of the way in which we ordered the scenarios, so this was a, a full day course where there were about six scenarios in sequence. Because of the scenario that we placed immediately before, we realized that we could actually create a recency bias um, that would tend to actually um, promote error happening again. And that was fascinating because it really shows that the errors um, don't occur in isolation, they occur in context of the training that is are surrounding a particular topic, the stuff that's actually happening in real time in somebody's clinical practice. And um, that was a fascinating feedback loop. No, that is interesting to see, right? I mean, it's interesting to see where where there's potential for de-risking or helping organizations certainly achieve achieve their goals that they're presented, right? So, so I mean, I say in the spirit of, of patient safety, I think one of the other questions that often pops up here is, which of these safety measures should be a standard procedure, right? And I think most will look at this and go, well, it kind of makes sense. Uh, certainly there's a lot of these that should be a standard procedure across the board, right? I mean, washing your hands makes sense, checking ID, thoroughly explaining the reason for any tests or procedures, all logically makes sense, but I can easily see individuals miss this. I mean, if you were to take a, a stab at this, which do you think is the most common um, that you would see present? It, I mean, for me, I often see uh, ID bands, right? That becomes the harder thing. I've seen workarounds where people have their cheat sheets and they have each individual patient sticker listed on there and they're leveraging that versus actually checking an armband. But I don't know if you've seen anything different. Uh, well, um, I mean, I guess you, the, there's a range, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hand hygiene's still been an issue. It'll continue to be an issue. So I'm curious of where uh, where folks have been. Yeah, so all of the above is the correct answer, is the million dollar answer. But how do we teach that, right? So, I mean, any recommendations from your uh, hands-on experience of how teaching or improving patient safety uh, washing hands? I mean, certainly we've seen elements of where individuals don't, uh, it's not practice to walk into the lab and wash your hands straight out the gate. Well, you know what, let me turn that question back on you, Amar. Please. So one of the interesting things that I feel like is at play for all of these issues here listed, hand washing, checking IDs, um, thorough explanations, is a feeling of time pressure. Um, and especially now during the pandemic, I think this idea that I, uh, especially when you're dealing with a COVID patient or COVID potential patient who is struggling to feel like I need to rush in there and save a life. I don't have time to do all of these things. And um, that, I mean, that is part of the reality of the pressure. So how, I mean, how could we use simulation to reinforce best practice? So that's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, how many folks out there are requiring gloves, right? As part of the, when, at the right appropriate time, right? So if they're doing a surgical procedure or a skill, are they requiring individuals to actually go through the sterilization techniques? And it's in this post COVID world where, you know, the argument of PPE is certainly a challenge. Um, should that not be part of the normal process? Muscle memory being what it is, should we not drape? Should we not clean? Should we not wash our hands? Should we not wear gloves? I mean, we pushed it, certainly, and the argument was, uh, was pushing that to make sure that you keep that muscle memory intact. But uh, uh, how many students do you feel like uh, uh, would, would, because of time and speed, would avoid that step completely, right, at the beginning of their procedure or skill or simulation experience? Um, you know, is it natural for for the residents um, or a, a, or even attendings or nursing to walk into a simulation lab, say hi to the patient, like a scenario, and immediately check an ID? I mean, we had to encourage it a lot of the times when we were doing stuff. I, mean, I don't know what it, how it's been for you and, and, and for for the institution. You know, um, so this joint commission standard of the of the two factor identification of patients was not part of our practice in the College of Medicine where I work because most of the emphasis was around diagnostic decision making and really not around reproducing the muscle memory of the things that you actually have to do in real clinical care. So we did adapt um, about a couple years ago, um, every single standardized patient encounter requires a double uh, 
I did double a uh, two factor patient identification, which has added a layer of challenge because um, the patient has to remember their actual birth dates. And for a patient who is, let's say, 35 years old, year on year, that date is going to move forward by, by one year. Um, whereas in the past, they would just say, I'm 35. Uh, with respect to the technology based simulation, that, that's an interesting nut to crack because many of the um, cases that are presented there involve coding patients. And it is really not encultured to do the two factor identification yet. I was going to say so, how do we change that, uh, that um, nuance, right? How do we change the notion of making sure that we're doing two factor authentication? Because that, that can drive clinical practice and care, right? Delivery, certainly, because of, of history that we missed or of medications that are on the patient or something else, right? So, I mean, is there a tip or a trick that, that exists to encourage that behavior to continue through in those cases as well, in that urgency case? I don't know about tips or tricks. I, it, it was uh, somewhat painful to, <laughs> to change the practice. And uh, we kind of had to bite the bullet and say, uh, it's gonna be um, annoying to have to remember a year of birth that changes year to year. And, but we're gonna commit to that um, because, of, because of the importance. Super interesting to figure out a way around it, right? And for those that are listening out there, if you certainly have suggestions of what's worked well for you, feel free to, to, to jump on the chat and, and share your story. I mean, I think all of us are trying to work through this and you know, simulation is still in its, certainly in its, uh, I'll say infancy, right? So it's still building and growing and learning and tweaking. And um, this world of COVID certainly hasn't helped us a lot in terms of trying to drive, but it certainly has accelerated digital a um, hundred fold, right? So it's been interesting to see some of those changes, right? So. We're going to try to try to move on to digi uh, educational safety, and one of the pieces of educational safety I think it's important for us to talk about is the link, right? So there's a little bit of online training to look at, right, and the impact that online training has, the challenges associated with virtual augmented reality and guided mixed reality, and then the practice of simulation, right? And I think educational safety hits all of those, and Certainly, Dr. Park, if you, if you agree, let me know that, or let everybody know that uh, the discussions around, like, there's different elements of how we create safety in each of those spectrums. And I think they're combated different ways. Um, I mean, certainly, I'm curious of your notion of where do you think there are issues in educational safety that exist today? Because um, I think it'll drive some of our conversations around how we improve quality and safety across the board in, in the world of education. Well, uh, I would be interested in you, what your kind of number one would be. Um, I'm going to call out um, Aaron Calhoun and colleagues who just recently um, released a, an article in simulation and healthcare that has to do with the handling deception in simulation. Oh. And um, I, I think that is a um, fascinating and perhaps underexplored area um, to think about safety. And I'll put out there one question for people to chew on, which is uh, there's some work being done on, around unannounced standardized patients, so like secret shoppers, who are going into real clinical environments. And the treating um, clinicians know that somebody might show up that's an, that's an unannounced standardized patient, um, but they're not going to be told whether that's who are the unannounced standardized patients. The question for me is, is that simulation? Would we call that simulation? Um, for the actor, they know they're portraying a, um, a, a um, not their, their real self, um, but the treating clinician does not. And I, I um, the jury's out for me on whether I would classify that as simulation. Yeah, I can see the dilemma. And, it, and certainly the jury would be out for me as well, just to say, I mean, I, that's an interesting question and certainly one that drives additional understanding of where the potential for problem is. Because if you had a secret shopper in your room, right, and, and they were grading you or judging you, I'm not sure I'd be the happiest um, 
individual, right? Uh, certainly, I think knowing that you're you're um, being tested or evaluated is certainly important. But um, I mean, if I'm to look at these three here as a whole, uh, online, virtual, augmented, or guided mixed reality or practical simulation, where has the greatest risk across the board? I would still arguably say the practical simulation because the other two elements are in theory, right? Uh, evaluated, graded, scored. I mean, they're, they've been tested and tried and true and, and looked at. So you have a little bit more control over some online training and virtual uh, virtual learning elements, whereas the practical simulations can go sideways pretty quickly. Um, uh, and so some educational safety elements certainly play a role. I will say it's probably harder to debrief though, unless you, I mean, certainly curious your thoughts. Uh, how, you know, if I'm, I'm talking about quality and safety of an individual or an educational safety, I think it's harder to debrief in the online and virtual environment than it is in the practical simulation environment. I think it's harder to have that conversation with an individual. How so? What what do you think is harder? I so you know, uh, with virtual learning, you're relying on whatever that technology piece is, and you're building the debriefing components for learning, right? And certainly, um, if I'm using uh, augmented or mixed reality, I can use eye tracking and other things to help guide some of the debriefing points. Um, I, I I can think about a video game. So if I play, uh, um, uh, I'm going to date myself and say if I played Mortal Kombat right back in the day. And so if I'm, if I'm playing that game and I have a pre-brief that's telling you what the expectation is and a debrief that's there, learning isn't really, it's hard to gauge learning unless the element has drive towards literature. So if you ever take a hard code or something online, when you screw up, the debrief says you can find it here, right? It points you to the literature, tells you where to go. Great. But it's still on the learner to guide that discussion. There's no push pull that exists there. So I still think it's harder to, to gauge and learn. Whereas in practical sim, you're going to push me as a facilitator. You're going to ask me the right questions. You're going to make me think. You're going to help draw a conclusion. Um, and we still have to be careful because uh, we talked about this in the podcast a little bit, right? About, um, about culture plays a role in how debriefings drive that difference in place. And do we consider culture in the debriefing elements? And I think we could in a physical environment, but it's a lot harder in the online and virtual environment to do that. Well, I, you know what it brings to mind as you were talking is um, something that I had not explicitly considered before, which is um, how does the element of control play into the learner's experience and our intended um, goals for the learner experience. So um, if I'm going to do a team-based, technology-based sim where any number of things can happen, um, I have less, I'm sort of exerting less control over what's going to happen in that simulation. And I need to be prepared as a briefer to handle any number of things that might come up. Whereas if I want to execute a, I, I don't know, even a virtual reality simulation scenario or something where the exact same thing happens in exactly every time, and there's a limited number of things or limited number of ways in which a learner can interface with that experience. Now I've decided to exert more control. I might have more control over my decisions around debriefing, but uh, what's happening on the learner end? Um, is the more control, the less control, um, going to get me, going to get the learner to where I'd like them to go? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense, right? So control is certainly an element of driving that, that discussion forward, right? And so, it, it's a, it's a curiosity question, but you know, and the bigger picture is how does that impact educational safety? So. Uh, we hear this notion of psychological safety as an important portion of our work, right? We, are, we want people to really feel psychologically safe and understood and well-versed. And you hear this notion over and over again in simulation. Is there a difference? I mean, do you feel like there's a difference in online and virtual with psychological safety in mind? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and, and, in what ways? I suppose there are um, there are there's a there's a benefit and a risk. I think um, one of the things that we have noticed at UIC is for the technology-based simulation, we are almost exclusively virtual. 
with the exception of the skills training. But the mannequin stuff is all virtual. Um, what we've noticed that's really interesting is that the learners are more willing to step up and speak and make suggestions in a way that we didn't really, we don't really notice when they're there in person. So for some reason, the peer pressure or whatever it is, the learners seem to be more willing to take a chance um, and say what they really think, which has really been a super fascinating outcome. Um, on the flip side, since I don't have them in the room with me, if a learner gets triggered with some past trauma or if they're having difficulty, it is much harder for me to pick up on some of those nonverbals. And it is um, almost impossible for me to sort of take the learner in sidebar and say, hey, do you want to talk more afterwards without me being really obvious about it and, you know, on the video conference. So I guess there's, a, there's sort of those two aspects that I think about. Uh, but it, it certainly does change our, our thought. I mean, uh, we're still all learning about how to do these virtual experiences in real time and certainly trying to push it forward faster in a lot of ways because this is a reality certainly that I think is um, is here to stay and we'll talk about worker safety, uh, you know, certainly shortly, but the the educational safety still is true because what is considered essential learning right in 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 the scope of our work is simulation and the components of simulation essential. Can it be accomplished virtually? I mean, you certainly mentioned some elements are online, some elements are in person. Mixing the two get to, two together becomes a bit more challenging, measuring competencies. And this is where I always feel like augmented and virtual help you do that, but there are issues with creating a safe learning environment and certainly helping learners take it to the next level sometimes. And you can do it well in virtual augmented as long as it's got that rote controlled um, uh, pieces in place. And when you add AI into the mix, that just complicates things too, right? From an educational safety standpoint, I think AI can, can be taught good and can be taught bad. And it's important for us to drive that direction, but it certainly sets us up for some educational challenges ahead. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, a couple, uh, certainly a couple questions for the audience, right? So in this one, I think you'll, uh, based on the conversation, is education or educator safety a myth? I hope everybody knows the answer to this question. Certainly the answer is, uh, you haven't figured it out yet. I would say true, uh, uh, sorry, is, uh, is, um, is not true. It's not a myth, it's a reality of the world that we live in. And it's important for us to certainly take into action that, that piece, right? And so, you know, as we get into some of these other pieces, um, uh, I guess one of the most pivotal questions that pops up because this drives psychological safety, education safety. This drives a lot of the notions that we battle. And I promise you, if you've ever come to an IMSH or an Axel meeting or any other meeting out there, this is a topic of conversation that always comes up over and over again. And it is drives the conversation that's important for us to talk about, which is, is uh, it's acceptable to allow uh, the scenario to end in death, right? And I'm certainly curious of what everybody thinks out there is uh, of this. Um, I certainly have uh, my thoughts and opinions. Um, I don't know, uh, Christine, do you wanna start with yours or uh, or would you like me to, to, to drive mine a little bit? Yeah, please, after you. Um, I will say, I do believe that it is acceptable to allow a scenario to end in death, especially if the goal and the, the objectives of the entire program drive that. Right. So if you're creating a scenario that has a complex scenario or a complex case where ultimately the patient may pass as a result, um, uh, it, if it's part of the learning experience itself, yes, hands down. Now, the million dollar question that I will always dabble with is you head down one pathway and the student decides to head down a completely different pathway and ends up overdosing your patient. Do you stop? Do you pause, do you reset, or do you let it go and have a conversation around drug issues, challenges, overdoses, medical errors, and everything else that may have not been part of your initial objectives, but certainly pivotal, pivotal in understanding medicine and the impact it has on, on care delivery. So that's why I struggle with often, right? Because um, I don't know if there's a right answer to that. And that's where sometimes I would sit in the independence um, category, but I don't know if you have a notion on one way or another. 
Well, it's interesting because if I were playing um, a video game and I made a fa fatal error, I would, uh, my, my character would die, yeah, right? And, I, and, and um, that wouldn't destroy my day or affect my confidence. Uh, and so I, and so I think that in, uh, it, it connects to how much of it is tied up in our professional identity maybe. Um, and you know, what are, what are the terms of agreement um, for participation? And so I think that if I brought learners in and said to them, so today we're gonna talk about the importance of communication and then the patient died in that scenario. Um, that's not something that the learners maybe felt that they had signed up for. Um, versus if I told them so today we're going to do a simulation uh, and I, w I want you, the goal is for you to understand what it's like um, to see the patient die. And then afterwards we're going to talk about it. Um, now the learners do know what, what they have signed up for. Um, and, and it's interesting, this element of, it gets back to the question of deception. So will, let's imagine that I told the learners, your patient today is gonna die. Um, will that affect their ability to participate um, versus does it have to be a surprise? Um, and will that affect their ability to buy in would a learner say, oh, who cares? The patient's gonna die, so why even bother? Um, one of the things that we've learned in some work that we did at UIC is that telling people that their patient is gonna die in the simulation doesn't affect their participation at all. And in fact, um, in some ways, there's some anticipatory grief that starts to build around feeling that that moment is coming. Um, it's a thing that we have only just dipped our toe into exploring, so it's a super complex subject. And you wonder if that uh, anticipation doesn't drive something else, right? Like, it's like, well, the patient's going to die anyway. We know how the scenario is going to end. So now, nope, nope, now, nope, nope. Like, you, you wonder if they don't second guess uh, some of this because of that outcome, right? And so, you know, for years in sim also, the names drove that, right? I mean, I remember... Uh, doing cases and scenarios where the patient's name is, will he make it? Will he make it, right? So, so sometimes uh, the creativity in the names also drives some of that anticipation and that, that inner, um, inner questioning that's present. Um, I think, uh, I see Jacqueline, you've got a question. Do you wanna just uh, throw it in the chat? And we're happy to, to reply to it, right? It's there, awesome. Um, and throw it in the chat, we'll certainly come back to that question that you've got uh, that's there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, worker safety that's, uh, that's so important. And I think this is certainly um, pivotal in some of our stuff. And so I'm going to throw this poll out there. A lack of motivation often centers around um, attitudinal problems. And I'll throw out there what folks think. Um, uh, certainly motivation is a, is a key element and certainly today in, the, in this COVID life that we live, um, motivation is certainly an issue uh, or could be an issue, right? And um, I don't know if you've ever seen quality and safety issues as a result of a motivation, uh, Christine, or a lack of motivation or other issues. Lack of motivation is, um, I think for me, it depends what is the source of that lack of motivation. Um, but in general, I would say, yeah, it connects. Yeah, and certainly is, uh, um, and not only does it connect, I think um, um, it can create bigger problems, right? Because motivation drives your desire and my desire as a whole. Um, and so, but how do we solve motivational issues with individuals? Because it is important for us to highlight worker safety. Well, I'm gonna throw that question back at you, Omar. What do you think? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think if I don't feel safe within my own ground, so let's use, let's use a SIM center in general. You have educators that are 
demotivated for a number of multiple reasons, right? Uh, and they're providing education and training. Is there motivation to provide fact uh, in the training experience? Is the training experience for your learners going to be the best it can be? Um, or are there challenges that exist there uh, that certainly create issues for you from a patient safety? So for example, IV therapy. They're supposed to teach uh, students on IV. They're not motivated. They're not happy about the job. Students don't learn very well. Are the students more apt to make errors when they get in the clinical side, right? A demotivated resident doing training in the sim lab can certainly drive patient safety issues down the, down the pike as well. Um, and so I think worker safety is certainly driven by attitude and motivation. Uh, but, but I'm curious, you know, where we go, like how do we improve individual motivation that's out there, right? And, and how do we ensure that there's success around that? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if this is a, if this, well, this is a tangent, but I'll just say it. it it's one of the things that I um, have been really struck by is, is listening to all the conversations around burnout um, and fatigue and all those things that um, in the, I guess, in the conventional wisdom, the, um, you need to watch out for the worker or the learner or the resident who used to complain um, and who no longer complains, who's just silent and um, shut down. And that's really the most dangerous. So I, I think in leadership, we often don't want to hear people complaining. And we think about the complainers as the problem children, so to speak. Um, but really when that person crosses over and says, has given up and says it's not even worth me complaining anymore, and so we're talking here about sort of the lack of motivation, um, that's a pretty dangerous situation. So I'm going to flip it. What about the quiet one? What about the one that is, that seems to be not motivated to participate, that's sitting in the background, right? You know, how do, how do we engage them into the learning experience? And I mean, Many of us, I'm sure, have had that, uh, that student that's back there, and we certainly bring them, try to bring them forward. But do you see any sense of concern with the individual that is in the background that doesn't want to participate? Well, I do have a very particular bias on this. So uh, I am um, very keen to have people um, challenge my bias, which is, I think, um, we often have a, in, in the world in general, and maybe in particularly in the United States, have a bias towards extroversion. And we see quietness as a negative attribute. And um, I don't, I'm a pretty strong introvert. Um, I'm just not shy. Um, but if somebody um, is shy or is an introvert or has a different style, I think that can read as disinterest when it's not. Yeah. Yeah, no, great point. It's an excellent point in terms of, uh, you know, certainly in, in terms of the elements of, of driving simulation safety forward, right? Um, and, and then, you know, certainly uh, uh, safety in the workplace is a combination of certainly three measurable components, right? Uh, I'm curious of how, uh, of what our audience thinks about this, right? And I think there are three components to this the environment, um, the worker, the behavior, and then the accidents themselves. And I think, um, can the environment in the lab, so I'll use an incident to you for, from, a, from, from previous work, which was crash cart location, stretcher there, chaos in the lab, and then the student trips on the power cord that goes from the crash cart to the wall and then falls and whacks their head on the corner of the, of the crash cart, right? So certainly safety in the workplace, plays the role there, but it also creates other challenges for you because now you have an individual who's frustrated, who's injured, and then your students, you know, their peers are seeing him bleeding, and certainly there's a concern there. Um, but, you know, improving that is a challenge. I mean, it's a human factors element tied to to improving worker safety in that space. Um, and even for, for the education folks that are in there that could potentially get stabbed with needles or other things, I mean, using live energy, using needles, uh, do you have any concerns um, around that? I mean, using energy or or uh, live needles or real crash carts or real meds or fake meds or anything like that that drive that safety element in that space? Well, Abar, I'm not a human factors 
person. So I think I would look to you um, for more expertise in that area. However, uh, I will say I've really respected and been appreciative of the increase in conversation in our community of practice around this issue. Um, as you mentioned, should be used simulated meds or, or real medications. And the very real potential safety issue around would somebody potentially mistake this real, I mean, the simulated medication for a real medication. And um, that actually came up for us during the pandemic. So uh, our, the medical school leadership reached out to me to inquire whether they might be able to use our simulation center as a um, sort of surplus, a surge clinical space for COVID patients. And um, ultimately we said yes to the clinic rooms and no to the mannequin rooms because in our center, for example, we have the oxygen Christmas trees that if you turn on, you know, gas flows out, but it's not real oxygen. And we felt that the danger of somebody mistaking that use for real could be a huge, huge risk if you were trying to take care of a COVID patient in a simulated patient room. Well, and uh, even to the point, like one of the things that uh, AHRQ popped up, uh, it's probably been six years now, right? Seven years is flow meters, right? Air versus oxygen flow meters in the labs. And um, if is, uh, is oxygen, oxygen and air and air, and are you supposed to label it properly? And, you know, if you have a green flow meter, that's actually medical air that's flowing out. Is that a, an issue for you? I mean, there's all these safety issues um, from a training perspective and certainly from a teaching perspective that play a role. Um, and in this post-COVID world, I mean, are there any labs out there that have become overflow spaces for their healthcare systems, right? I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are. I haven't heard of any, but I'm, I'm sure there are. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of, of overflow space for sim labs um, in your recent discussions with folks. Um, certainly a challenge, right? And certainly improving quality and safety around that is an issue. Right? So if you've uh, answered this poll, the answer most certainly is uh, is environment worker and behavior. Uh, all three actually play a measurable component around uh, worker safety. Um, so uh, one of the other pieces I think I wanted to wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about, especially as we look at the at the um, uh, at September seventeenth date, is is uh, worker violence, and this holds true both in the education environment as well as in healthcare and certainly very prominent in healthcare. And if you're a healthcare provider out there, uh, you may or may not have had, unfortunately, a personal experience tied to this, right? Um, I can certainly say I have had a personal experience many of times growing up in the front EMS service, but I'll throw this question out there. Between 2002 and uh, 2013, incidences of severe workplace violence were four times more common in healthcare than in the private industry. And I am certainly curious of everybody's thoughts around this um, uh, as well. And, um, you know, for me, this is uh, near and dear. You get uh, challenging patients and um, or medicated patients that create issues for you, but this does become a massive uh, worker safety issue. Um, I mean, uh, Christine, you're in, you're working today, you're practicing clinically, you're certainly working in the education space. I mean, what are your thoughts around this? Well, I, it strikes me that workplace violence to me probably looks very different than workplace violence did to you. So what did that look, what, what comes to mind when you think of workplace violence? So, I mean, I think for me, it's a combination of, of abuse uh, by peers, coworkers, um, or, or otherwise, as well as, right, growing up in the healthcare and fire service, as well as patients. Right or the for me it was the general public as well. So, you know, in the fire service we had many a times where we'd roll up onto a scene and um, the environment around us was not safe. Right, and we got hit or smacked or kicked or punched or anything all of the above. So that is workplace violence. It happened in my workplace. I was exposed to it. Um, I got injured as a result of it. Right, it just it was an unsafe environment um, as well. I would envision hospitals are no different. Right whether it's the patient or their family member or a peer or a colleague or something else, it is still, to me, workplace violence by definition. Well, I, I have to say that I am lucky that I've never uh, had a patient actually try to physically 
assault me. Um, and maybe that's because I'm an anesthesiologist, so most of the time they're under my pharmacologic control. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, all joking aside, I think violence can take the form of physical violence and as well as psychological violence, as you alluded to, Amar. And um, all of this, all of this other stuff related to um, gender, um, racial, racial violence, um, all that stuff uh, is just as common, if not more common in healthcare. And, and, and maybe in some ways it is more painful because in healthcare, we believe that we're called to maybe a higher standard than just, you know, uh, in, the, in the street um, or, you know, going shopping in the grocery store. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe that's why it feels more painful to, to experience that at work. Yeah. Well, it's not fun either way, right? I mean, um, it certainly is a challenge. And, and uh, so I was looking at some data <clears throat> recently on this topic and certainly some of the stuff that the World Health Organization has populated in, um, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in 2017, right? And I'll, let's see if I can pull this graph up for, you, for everyone to see, but I think it's pivotal and certainly very telling um, in, in nature uh, of where things are, right? This is healthcare violence is the top red line, and this is every other industry across the board, right? So manufacturing, retail, construction, it's telling to see that it is, uh, it, it's at 9.1 compared to 1.9, and this is from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and, in, and so it was reported 18,400 such injuries reported uh, in the private industry, uh, sorry, in the industry as a whole, and of which 71% of those were healthcare related we're in the hospital or in other areas, right? And super, super scary when you think about um, where that is and the impact that certainly has on, on us as individuals because it's demotivating. I mean, imagine you getting hit or hurt in the, it, at work, you really don't wanna go back. It's the, uh, it's the place where you took a hit, right? I mean, it's not, it, it just, it feels personal um, uh, as well, right? So certainly a, a big challenge um, as well. And, and, you know, one of the other facts here that's important, and this holds true both in the lab setting as well as in the educational setting, um, is one clinic in uh, Northeast Ohio reported confiscating 30,000 weapons at entry point into the hospital system, right? So certainly a, a challenge and a risk that's present. And these numbers are, are staggering when you certainly talk about, um, uh, when you certainly talk about the impact um, creating a safe learning environment has and creating frustrations. I mean, I've seen full on fist fights in the lab before uh, where, you know, providers disagree and it just turns into this massive challenge and it's a full on fight. Um, and catching that I think is super difficult to do um, overall. And I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, but I think um, it does allow us to be more aware of where people are and, and the impact it has uh, across the board. Sure, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so throwing this out there, certainly uh, we're approaching the tail end of our time, uh, but um, before we open it up to Q&A, um, on uh, September 23rd at 2 p.m., uh, we're hosting a, another um, a virtual lab on distance learning for nursing in 2020, uh, lessons learned so far, and you can certainly access that um, following the QR code. You know, a lot of our focus is certainly on um, showing you the stuff that's out there and talking about key topics of interest. And, you know, certainly uh, 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 my thanks to Dr. Park for joining us today and talking about quality and patient safety and the impact it has, especially as we look at, uh, at improving healthcare outcomes. Uh, so I'm gonna open the floor up for some, uh, some q and I know um, uh, there are some folks that have a q and I'll throw this out there as we are answering some questions for everybody uh, across the board. Um, I know there is a hand raised, and certainly I think, Olivia, I'm not sure if you want to unmute uh, Jacqueline. I think Jacqueline has her hand up. Uh, sure. She wanted to ask a question. Yep, no problem. Hi, Jacqueline, you're Hi. on now. How are you? Yeah. Uh, I actually just had a comment to, um, about what you guys were talking about, whether or not you should let the patient die Yeah. Um, in, in a scenario. I feel like I've gone through quite an evolution about 
early on when I was a facilitator of thinking that was okay to allow a patient to die, but I've become much more sensitive um, to the participants now. And um, I find that working with, I don't work with students mostly, but we, I work with uh, interprofessional um, participants. So it's usually a surgeon, nurses, um, nurse anesthetists, and um, a crew that is already practicing. And I find I'd much rather, or our team has decided that we'd much rather have the team, the participants succeed rather than go down the wrong path. We may let them go really far down the path, the wrong path, but we always have our actor or confederate in there to pull them back in because we want in the end for it to be a good experience. We don't, and we know how sensitive people can feel when a patient dies or they feel like a failure. Um, and I, I feel like with high fidelity simulation especially, it can really leave an implant print. Like we all know that post-traumatic you know, stress syndrome you know, can happen. Um, and, and we just find like it, it's better for them to practice doing the right things than to go right down the wrong path and never get the practice in doing the right things. That, that's just my opinion, our opinion. Yep. Thanks for sharing. Um, Christine, did you want to comment real quick on it? Or? Yeah, you know, I, I think what you're pointing to is this very early on, one of the things we learned in students as young as the second year of medical school already have tied up with their professional identity. Success means patient lives. If patient dies, I'm a failure. And that's a really, I mean, so part of what we are actually seeking to do in one of the experiences that we designed and curated for the learners is intentional creation of patient death. And um, it's different because for a 15 minute scenario, it's an hour and 15 minutes of post event processing. So it's much longer. And we have the time to really unpack all of that and try to help the learners understand that, that, that death doesn't mean failure. And also su surviving also doesn't mean success in terms of you know, what you've done. So um, anyway, I think you, you really sort of articulated the importance of understanding the sensitivity of the learners and, and why they're there and then what will be the best for the learning outcome that you're going for. There's, you know, it's interesting. There's been a lot of discussions uh, around um, where the this notion or this divide started, and I, I've heard stories, and certainly seen occasions where some of the challenges are related to the educator themselves, right? Where the where they head down this pathway, and it's a med error, and it's a great conversation to talk about medication errors and double checking dosing, and when the dosing is way off, and you've got to get 15 vials of the same drug to give to your patient, there should be a flag that gets raised and other things. And oftentimes the stories that you hear of some of these early discussions where it was the educator that went to the student and said, you did this, you killed the patient, it's all your fault they're dead. And that's very disheartening and demotivating as a learner where you're trying to make sure that there's that connection and that growth and that learning that happens. And you know, sometimes the learning's on us as the educator to learn what the best way to have that conversation with the student is. Right? So, it's a great question and thank you for sharing. Um, so we'll uh, certainly continue to keep the Q&A question open. We've got about a few more minutes left. Is there any other questions out there? Please feel free to, to jump on the chat and just type your question in the chat and we'll be happy to, to take a note of it. Um, as we're uh, doing that, certainly I'm, I'm curious uh, 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 of two things, right? And that is um, uh, the drive for improving quality and patient safety certainly doesn't start um, with just a simple conversation. And this has been a challenge for, for a number of years out there. I mean, what are your thoughts, Christine, on, on how we get the word out and improve safety across the organization? I mean, there isn't a million dollar trick to this. Hand, hand hygiene has been an issue for 200 years. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna continue to be a challenge, but um, you know, there's, always, uh, there's always ways to improve that. Any, any thoughts on what, what we should all be focusing on or, or driving that forward? I think um, rather than a concrete, rather than a concrete example, I yeah. think I'll share a, a thing that has been very useful for me, which is uh, our um, aspirations to save the world can sometimes be really, really overwhelming, especially in these days. And uh, I, I guess um, even one 
successful outcome or one improvement um, is really meaningful. And I think uh, to, especially in the time of this pandemic is to pace ourselves, to not expect perfection, um, and really to understand how much more all of this pandemic has shined a light on the potential of simulation and really lean into that and leverage that. Nope, some great, uh, some certainly some great uh, thoughts and some great parting words, right? So um, I, I would say my, my thanks to you for taking the time to, to jump on and to talk to everybody. Um, and thank you for, for all the conversation that you've had, certainly for um, allowing the questions and some of the directions to, to come through and for all your work in simulation um, and your contributions that you made. And thanks for everybody for joining us today. Thank you for the Society for Simulation Healthcare for allowing us to talk to you and, and, uh, and be part of this. Um, have a wonderful and safe rest of the day. Bye. Thanks, Samara. Thanks, Christine. Thank you.